turn to 1 Peter. This passage that we're looking at today, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Peter chapter 2, really goes hand in hand with the previous passage, verse 22 through 25 of chapter 1. You could call this part 2 of Peter's point there. The title of the message this morning is The Believer's Spiritual Nourishment. The Believer's Spiritual Nourishment. Now likely we've all had situations where we know children, young children, whether they be family members or good friends, that uh, you've seen these children when they're very young and then maybe you go for a period of time not seeing them, a period of time between visits and that sort of thing, and the next time you see them you're just amazed at how much they've grown. In fact, that's always seems to be the topic of conversation as soon as you see the children again. My, look at how you've grown. You've gotten so big. You're going to be as tall as me the next time I see you. And uh, children grow fast, don't they? So rapidly. Even for us parents with our own children. Uh, they're, they're little babies, and then we turn around and all of a sudden they're talking to us like adults with maturity and growing up into the strength of the Lord, and they grow so fast. But in order to grow, obviously we know from a physical standpoint, children need nourishment. They need nourishment. They need all of the fundamental building blocks of life to help them grow both physically in their strength and also mentally so that their minds function the way that they're supposed to function. And it's our job as parents and grandparents and family members to make sure that they're getting everything that they need. Likely we've also seen children on commercials or videos in other parts of the world who are not getting the things that they need. We've all seen the pictures of starving children in different countries where they don't have access to the same types of nutrition that we have here, and it's often a a sight that could even bring you to tears when you consider the suffering that goes on in this world. This morning in Peter's passage, he compares us to children, even to babies. And the comparison here is that from a spiritual standpoint, like children, we also must have all of the fundamental building blocks of our spiritual life. And that's it. That, that's if we are to grow in Christ. If we are to progress, you could call this progressive sanctification. If we're going to become more like Christ every day from the point of salvation to the point that we go to be with Him. But very much like physical children and physical nutrition, there are things that can block those fundamental building blocks. There are things that can stunt our spiritual growth. And that's exactly what he's warning us about this morning as well. So as he turns us to seek after the things that will bring us spiritual growth, he also contrasts that by telling us to put off the things that would stunt our spiritual growth, things that would prevent us from growing in Christ. You see, for us, a lack of love for others, a lack of love for those in the body of Christ, sinful thoughts towards them, this hinders our desire for the nourishment, therefore hinders our spiritual growth. Where sinful thoughts towards others exist in the mind of the believer, the natural byproduct will be spiritual stagnation. If you're characterized by animosity and discontent towards other people in your heart, then it directly affects your desire for the Word of God. It directs, it affects your desire for truth, your consumption of the Word, and your ability to grow. So we must develop the right mindset about all of these things if we're going to grow. If we're going to be able to properly absorb the food of God, And so as we look at this passage, we're going to see three factors of mental formation that advance our spiritual growth. 
three factors of mental formation that advance our spiritual growth. We have to think properly about these things. We have to think properly about the progress of sanctification in our lives. The first of these three factors is cast off the mindset that stunts your growth. Cast off the mindset that stunts your growth. The second, seek out nourishment that advances your growth. Seek out nourishment that advances your growth. And the third, consider the salvation that produced your growth. Consider the salvation that produced your growth. Three factors of mental formation that advance our spiritual growth. So look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, we come to you this morning as children transformed by the power of your Spirit, brought into newness of life, knowing that we have an inheritance set apart for us. And Lord, we come to you also recognizing that we cannot simply receive salvation and receive this knowledge and then sit still. We cannot simply become complacent and comfortable in this life as we await eternity, but rather we must work, we must strive, we must seek after spiritual growth. We must desire the thing that brings about spiritual nourishment. This is the progressive sanctification that you've set us apart for. And so, Lord, I ask this morning that you would help us to develop a mindset that drives us to growth. Conform our minds and our hearts to your word. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. And so as we look at this passage first, if you notice that word, therefore, he's connecting that to our previous passage. Now, previously, in verses 20 through, 22 through 25, we learned that since we have in obedience to the truth purified our souls for a sincere love of the brethren, we must fervently love one another from the heart. And this is in keeping with the eternal nature of the Word of God, that Word of God that has transformed us. And so as we love one another, we do this with eyes towards eternity, recognizing that our relationships with one another, those of us who have been transformed by the Word of God, are going to last for all time. So we love one another as those who are members of an eternal family. This is what we must do. This is what we're called to, and it's what he commands us to here, comparing these relationships to the Word of God. And now as he transfers into this passage, we're, he's transferring from the transformation of salvation that has occurred to us by the Word of God into what are we to do now, which is continue to grow according to the Word of God. So we don't simply sit back and coast and allow ourselves to become stagnant, but rather we grow. We grow towards Christ. We grow upward in perspective towards Him. We conform ourselves to Him and conform our minds to His Word. So that means that we have to be active. Active in our thoughts. Active in our mental process. Active in how we think about this life and how we think even about one another. And so as we seek after spiritual growth, it's, it's key that we recognize there are things that are detrimental to our spiritual growth. This first factor, cast off the mindset that stunts your spiritual growth in verse 1, where he says there, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, 
that, that term, laying aside, it has the same idea of disrobing yourself, of taking off your garments. You can think of it as coming in from a long day's work and if you've been outside and you're dirty and your garments are soiled and it's not something that you want to get into bed with, what are you going to do? You're going to rid these things of yourself so that you don't carry all of that grime and dirt into your home. Take off these garments. Rid yourself of these things. But these things that he's talking about here are attitudes, mindsets, the way that we think and then the way that our thoughts direct our actions towards one another. So in this way, we must disrobe ourselves of attitudes of sin towards one another. We must put off all of these attributes. And this is what progressive sanctification looks like. It is a put-off and a put-on process. We are putting off the sinful deeds of the flesh. We are casting these things away from us. And we are putting on the truth, the truth according to the Word of God. Now this word, uh, to take off or to cast off, is used in Ephesians 4.22 by Paul when he says of us who have learned of Christ. He says, having laid aside or taken off the old man in reference to your former conduct, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. And so putting off the old ways of the flesh is an active process that we must be firmly committed to. As we've been discussing, this verse begins mentally. We have to come back to our thoughts and intentions, back to the desires within us and and recognize that our flesh is driving much of our desires, recognize that these things that come from within us, how we feel and then how our feelings affect our thoughts, this is where the battle takes place. This is where we must begin to put off when we recognize sinful motivation in our body welling up within us, driving our thoughts. Then we have to attack it at its source. We identify it as what it is, sin. And so if we are to progress, we must commit ourselves to daily putting off these deeds of the flesh. But here specifically in this context of loving one another, he gives us some very specific things, very specific mindsets that we are to put off. He attaches the word all to many of these, saying that there's no room, there's no room in our minds for any of these types of thoughts towards others, any of these motivations towards others. We must rid ourselves completely of it. And the first is this term, malice. Malice. Laying aside all malice. Now, this is harboring sinful anger towards one another. This term can mean simply evil in a general sense, but as it applies to our relationships to one another, this is a kind of anger that can be produced within us when a person does something to us or they're doing something that we don't approve of. It is to hold a grudge towards someone with perhaps, which perhaps leads to a desire to enact vengeance on that person for what they have done. It can even be the result of being sinned against. We talked about th- that this morning in Sunday school, how... There are times when people legitimately sin against us, when we are victimized, and then there are other times when people simply do things that we don't approve of, that aren't sin at all. But the danger for us is not being victimized, it is rather what that wells up inside of us, which is anger, malice, holding a grudge, holding on to the thing in our hearts, and then oftentimes reacting according to it. Regardless, harboring anger within our hearts toward another believer is always detrimental to our spiritual growth. It destroys our walk with God. In Matthew 5, 22 through 24, Jesus explains that the person who is angry with his brother is guilty enough to go into the fires of hell. He then says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, 
Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. In other words, sinful anger in our heart toward other believers is something that should be addressed even before we attempt to worship God. We can't worship the Lord properly if we are harboring malice in our heart towards other believers. It affects our worship. We're commanded to rid ourselves of it and then come and offer up worship to our God. It's a sobering reality. In other words, sinful anger in our heart towards other believers is something that should be addressed right now, immediately. When we realize that it's there, we put it to death, we put it off, we repent, and we seek the Lord. It's hypocritical for us to come to church on Sunday morning, sing songs, read our Bibles, and yet harbor malice and resentment in our hearts towards other Christians. How can we do this? We're commanded not to. So we put it off. We rid ourselves of it. We seek repentance before the Lord. The second of these terms that he says to rid ourselves of is deceit. This, this attitude of deceitfulness, of being dishonest. And the word he uses here is dolos. And I want you to remember that because we're actually going to circle back to this word. He uses it again later in this passage, dolos. This particular word it involves a purposeful motivation to deceive someone by leading them astray. It literally means baiting someone, to bait someone into something to present something to them in a deceitful way, to make them believe something that is untrue. This is a premeditated kind of deceit. Back in Ephesians 4, Paul also explains that deceitfulness must be put away from the life of believers in verse 25, saying, Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are to put off all deceit. Put off dishonesty. Refuse to lead others astray, no matter what it may be, no matter what the situation is. And while it's obvious that we should not be characterized by blatant forms of lying and deceitfulness, we may be tempted to focus on the obvious and more sinister ways of deceit while overlooking some of the more covert ways we are tempted to be deceptive in the church. You think about that. Are there ways that we try to present ourselves to others that are deceitful? Are there things that we say that in an attempt to cover over what's actually going on in our hearts or in our lives? Are we ever deceitful when we interact with one another? That leads us right into this next term that he says we are to put off from ourselves, and that is hypocrisy. We are to put off hy hypocrisy, pretending to be something that we're not. Pretending to have certain aspects of our life put together when we know that in those same areas we are constantly living in sin. It is putting on a mask for people to see. That's exactly what this word hypocrisy means. Back when it was original, originally coined in the Greek language, this actually described actors. Actors in, in plays who would put on a mask, these, these masks that were very uh, flamboyant, and then they would try to act as the personality in the mask. They would act as something that they were not. They came to be known figuratively to refer to someone who was purposefully attempting to present themselves as something that they weren't. Jesus describes Jewish religious leaders this way in Matthew 23, 13, when he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. The Pharisees were those who trusted in themselves for righteousness. They built for themselves a legalistic system of rules that allowed them to build themselves up in righteousness, not getting close to the, the, the law, not getting close to transgressing the law, but then at the very same time constantly looking for loopholes that they could get around the law and gratify their sinful desires. Hypocrites, 
pointing their fingers at others, exalting themselves in righteousness. They were the epitome of hypocrisy, having a form of external religion, but spiritually dead on the inside. We're to not be characterized by hypocrisy in the church. Let us never put on an air of righteousness. Let us never exalt ourselves according to God's standard, knowing, knowing that in our heart we are far from it. The fourth term that he uses here is envy. Envy, the fourth mindset that we're to strip away from ourselves. And this is similar to jealousy. It is to be displeased with the good fortune of another believer, to have such bitterness within our heart towards that person that when they seem to be doing well or when they seem to receive good things or receive praise, we are bothered by that. We actually secretly wish their downfall. Envy. Terrible thing that our flesh does naturally. This is to rejoice in the downfall of those we oppose. To rejoice in the downfall of our enemies. But in contrast, Proverbs 24, 17 through 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. This kind of envious jealousy towards others is devoid of love and only serves to wreak spiritual havoc on our own souls. We are to love all those in the church. We are to consider one another as better than ourselves, as more important than ourselves. And we are to seek out the betterment of one another above ourselves. That goes both for those who are easy to get along with and those who are not so easy to get along with. Those who are easy to love and those who are not easy to love. It's, it's very simple to put away these mindsets towards people who are nice and patient and kind to us. It's very hard to put away these types of mindsets towards people who are difficult and sinful and make our lives miserable sometimes. But we must put away these things. In keeping with these mindsets, he then says, put away the outward expression of all of these things. Put away evil speaking. Put away evil speaking. This is backbiting, detraction, slander. It's painting another believer in a negative light for the purpose of tearing them down. It's complaining about other believers and attempting to soil their reputation. This is different. This is a different form of speaking about another person in the church out of concern because they are in sin, but rather it's speaking about another person in the church in an attempt to tear them down, to ruin their reputation. This sinful form of slander is motivated by anger. It's motivated by malice, by all of these things that we just talked about. It's motivated by a desire for the person's downfall. And so we go about attempting to bring their downfall through our words. Our flesh does this naturally. It brings these things up within us. But we must recognize it and actively put it off. And when we're talking about evil speaking, there, there is an active component to this for us personally. And then there's also a passive component. And what I mean by that is for us as an individual, when we're tempted to talk negatively about other believers in the church, we must recognize it at the point that we're tempted to do it, repent of it, put it away from ourselves, and simply not act according to it. But also, from a passive standpoint, if you are another believer in the church and someone comes to you with this type of sin, if they come to you and they begin speaking in a sinful light about other believers in the church, what are you to do? Do not take part in it. Don't be a party in it. Don't be a party to their sin. Walk away. Tell them, this conversation is not edifying. It isn't glorifying to the Lord. So let's change the subject. 
help your brother or your sister understand that this is not glorifying to God. So we have to put this away from ourselves. This kind of sin does not always start as obvious, open malice and hatred, but rather it so often starts with discontentment. Discontentment towards our fellow believers. Discontentment with how they're behaving, with how they're acting, with how they're interacting with us. And it begins to fester, and it begins to grow. And as it grows, it starts to create these attitudes in our mind. We well up in our pride. We view others in a negative light. And it leads, ultimately, to division. These kinds of mindsets and this type of outward flowing of these mindsets, the speaking that comes along with it, it will destroy a church. It doesn't simply destroy the individual. It doesn't simply stunt our own growth. It goes farther than that, and it wreaks havoc within the church of God. So... As he points out to us here, these are the unloving thoughts and actions we're to put off from ourselves in the body of Christ. We must, as he says, rid ourselves of all aspects of these sinful traits. Rid your mind of everything to do with it. Completely put it off from you. We do this by being cognizant of the motivations behind everything we do. We must realize that this is the spiritual warfare we are warned about and that we are called to. The church is a mixture of people. The church is full of people who sin and people who are imperfect and people who make mistakes. And we must all interact with one another. And in so doing, our flesh is going to be tempted. It's going to constantly be tempted. And so what we must do is put off the deeds of the flesh that would cause division and cause anger and cause malice and cause strife. Be actively putting these things away from us, fighting these things within our mind, and putting on love for one another. Patience. Grace. Viewing others as more important than ourselves. Being concerned for our brother or sister in Christ, but concerned about their spiritual well-being. The flesh is going to motivate us, but the key to putting off the flesh is as soon as you feel these sinful motivations welling up inside of you, you fight them there. You rid yourself of them. Seek the Lord in prayer. Fight against the way you feel. Remind yourself that these things are displeasing to God and ask Him to help you to overcome. We we have to remember God knows all of our thoughts. He knows all of our intentions. He knows exactly what's motivating us. So go ahead and confess it to Him. He already knows. So we actively put away these thoughts and actions, repenting of this sin and turning to think and act in a way that is pleasing to Him. As I mentioned before, this active putting off process this, this casting away sinful mindsets from ourself, this is one side in this progressive sanctification, this growing to be more like Christ. But we also must put on something else. That's exactly what Peter's command is now, the positive side of sanctification. Rather than craving the lying desires of the flesh, we must desire and seek after the truth of the Word. And so the second factor, seek out nourishment that advances your growth. Seek out nourishment that advances your growth. And so we've cast off the mindset that stunts our growth. We've put away all of these things that hinder our spiritual growth. And now we're going to actively seek out that food, that food that raises us up into spiritual maturity. Verse 2, he says, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. 
Now this next command, this other side of the sanctification process, long for the pure milk of the Word, this is the main command of this passage. And you've heard me point that out over the past several passages that we've dealt with since verse 13. This is built upon the reality that we have been saved, that we have been given the Holy Spirit, that we now have an inheritance waiting for us. We've received the transformation of the Word of God within us. Therefore, now we act, we do. And this is the command. It's really the fifth command in this series. Long for the pure milk of the Word. This command to long the milk of the Word, it gives us the, the view of a newborn baby. How a newborn baby craves its mother's milk. And we can all imagine how babies desire the nourishing milk that's so needed for their development. The first six months of a baby's life outside of the womb are a time of rapid physical growth. They're a time of rapid mental development. The immune system is developing. They begin to become coordinated and to respond with the world around them. It's a miracle to watch how babies grow during this time frame. And it's just amazing how the Lord has designed infants to develop according to the nourishment that He's provided the Lord designed a source of nourishment specifically for them that gives them everything that they need for proper development, and that is the mother's milk. The milk provided by a healthy, well-nourished mother contains all the necessary building blocks for the infant's development. And it's for this reason that God has also designed within the baby that innate knowledge, the natural drive, that the mother has everything that I need. So what do newborn babies do? They scream for the milk. That's all they do, right? When they first come out, they're hungry. They scream. They want their mother. They scream. They crave the milk. They desire the milk. They eat nonstop, almost round the clock, it seems like. And as they do this, they grow. They grow according to their desire. And this is how we're commanded to crave the milk that God has provided for us. The implication here is that this is the Word of God presented in the Scriptures. We are to put off the desires of the flesh that hinder our growth, that stunt our growth, and put on the desire, the craving for the Word of God. Like milk for a newborn, the Word of God grants life for the believer. It is the source of all spiritual nourishment. It is totally sufficient to give us everything that we need. Therefore, we commit ourselves to it. A believer who's cut off from the Word of God is like an infant cut off from life-giving milk. If we're to grow in progressive sanctification, that is, if we are to become more and more like Christ each day. We must view the Word of God as our daily source of sustenance. We must consume it. This means that seeking nourishment from the Word of God should be, for the believer, our utmost priority. Our utmost priority. If we understand how vital the Word is for our spiritual growth then a day should not go by that we're not feeding our mind with its truth. How are the ways that we do this? How do we seek after this milk, the milk of the Word? Well, we come to church. We sit under the teaching and the preaching of the Word. We bring our children to hear the teaching and the preaching of the Word. We interact with one another in fellowship and discipleship. And we minister the Word throughout the week to one another. We minister the Word to our families and to our children daily. And we as individuals commit ourselves to studying and consuming the Word of God on a daily basis. This is your nourishment. This is your food. And it's more vital that you get this food even than the food that grows your physical body. This is spiritual food. Consume it daily. 
In Acts 2, 41 through 42, it tells us of the early church that those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls, and they were continually, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. This is what the church does. This is what believers do. They commit themselves to fellowship around the Word. In Hebrews 10, 24-25, he says, "And Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, believers, true believers come together in fellowship around the Word and submit themselves to the regular teaching of the Word because they know that the Word is their source of life. They must be tapped into it. They must be connected to it. The weekly preaching and teaching of the Word of God, the discipleship of the Word of God with other believers, and the study of the Word of God individually, this is how we feed ourselves this truth. We approach the Word of God with humility, with grace, with the understanding that this is truth. And we put away all of the lies that come in around us from the world. We put away what we think we know about things and we allow the Word to minister to us and transform us and conform us to the mind of God. Because that's exactly what the Word is. The Word is the divine mind of God communicated to us, expressed to us. The most vital thing for us. Now, he describes this milk, this milk that we're to consume with with two words here. First, he says it is pure. It is pure. Some versions say the pure milk of the Word. Some say pure spiritual milk. But both translating this word pure here the same way. Now, this word is interesting. You remember I said to make a note of that word dolos back in verse 1. The word for deceit. We're circling back to it here because this word for pure is actually the opposite of dolos. It is adolos, adolos, undeceitful. Undeceitful is what this word means. This this word dolos, where it means it, it meant deceitful trickery. The word here, adolos, it means the absence of deceitful trickery. The absence of deceitful trickery. This milk does not contain within it anything that would lead us astray. The Word of God is clear. It is understandable. This is the perspicuity of the Word. So as we are to put off deceitful trickery within our own minds because it hinders our spiritual growth, we are to desire the opposite of deceit, which is the truth and the clarity of the Word of God. This Word does not bait anyone using sleight of hand. It does not present something as being true with any kind of underhanded meaning. It doesn't have some hidden, deeper spiritual component to it that's not readily discernible. The Word of God is understandable. It means what it says. One commentator writes of this particular word, adolos, and he says, in this context, it means to have no double meaning. The Word of God presented according to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the original meaning of the instrument or author has no double meaning. The Word of God means what it says and says what it means. This has major implications for us as we seek to study the Word of God on our own. You see, if you are to consume the Word of God daily on your own, then it's good to know that the Word of God is clear, that it's understandable. We can study it. 
if we've been changed, if we are spiritual because we have been internally dwelt by the Holy Spirit, then if we approach the Word of God with humility, we approach it inductively, we study it correctly, we can understand what it says. The Word of God is written for us. It's written for believers. And it's written so that we may know the mind of God. It's a wonderful reality for us. And now in keeping with this understanding that Scripture is clear and it's discernible at face value, Peter also tells us more about the nature of this milk, this milk that nourishes us. He says, where you see some versions saying, pure milk of the Word, and some versions saying, pure spiritual milk. That's because they're kind of taking two different positions on translating this one word, which is logikos, of the word, or spiritual, logikos. And this is an interesting word, and it actually is kind of a difficult way of of producing an English translation for this. But this word logikos, it, it helps to understand what it means. This is from... The family of words along with logos, where we would get our word for logic, to think or to perceive and to work through something using our mental faculties. The logos is the divine mind of God communicated to us. Logikos is to work this truth through our minds and consider it and to understand it. This is the milk of reasoning, you could say. The milk that nourishes our mental faculties. This is exactly what the Word of God does. It brings us into alignment with truth. It gives us the discernment of truth. The Scriptures open our minds to what is accurate and they help us to reason appropriately. That's why those who reject God and reject the Scriptures are given over to a mind that doesn't function properly. We as believers are those who think correctly because we think according to the Word of God. You see, the Christian life is not mystical. It's not merely esoteric or spiritual in depth. It's not driven by emotion or some inner voice. The Christian life and Christian knowledge is concrete. It is black and white. It is clearly discernible by those who know God. It's because the Word of God makes sense, and the Holy Spirit brings us under conformity to it. So what does this mean for us? It means that we seek out the nourishment of the Word of God. The more we consume this Word, the more our reasoning ability is transformed by what is right and true according to God. We crave the milk that is able to renew our minds, this milk that gives us discernment and insight into all things. And as we seek out this nourishment, if, if you want to know how to answer this culture, this culture that has gone haywire, all of these things that seem like insanity, well, consume the milk of the Word. Consume the truth of God. If you want to know how to develop a right understanding of theology, a right view of yourself and of God, then consume the milk of the Word. If you want to know how to address areas of sin in your life or the life of others, consume the milk of the Word. If you want to know how to identify and fight against false religion and apostasy and heresy, consume the milk of the Word. Major in the truth of Scripture. Let this be your focus. Because this Word is able to make us wise unto salvation. And this Word is able to pierce through the deepest avenues of the human heart and to discern the things that are going on within us, discern our thoughts and intentions. So, all of this to say, commit yourself to the Word of God. Commit yourself to the local church. Commit yourself to discipleship.
commit yourself to daily studying its truth. This is how you grow in spiritual maturity. And so as we do these things, as we put off mindsets that are unloving, mindsets that hinder our growth, and as we put on the desire and the seeking out of the nourishment of the truth of the Word of God, there's one more factor that I want us to consider. Short factor here, consider the salvation that produced your growth. Consider the salvation that produced your growth. Verse 3, he says, conditional statement here, do these things if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. If you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, he's assuming that this is true. He's assuming that all of his hearers here have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. Therefore, they understand the nourishment that is provided to them from the Lord. So, taking it back to your salvation that day when you were transformed by the Word of God, when you came into submission to Jesus Christ as Lord, when your sins were forgiven, when the grace of God was applied to your account, if you have tasted that this milk is good, then seek it out. Don't become stagnant. Don't become complacent. Seek out the source of your salvation. Seek out the Word. But there's an equally negative condition here as well. You see, there are those who have not tasted the kindness of the Lord. There are those who know nothing of what we're talking about. And there are those in the visible church who do not know what this nourishing milk can accomplish within them. These unregenerate souls, they, they cannot effectively put off malice. They can't put off the deeds of the flesh because they are enslaved to the deeds of the flesh. They don't desire the milk of the Word. They don't seek after it. They can't even understand it apart from the Spirit's work. So if you're someone here who's never tasted the kindness of the Lord and salvation, turn yourself Christ today. This is what the Scriptures say. All of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have transgressed the standard. Therefore, all of us stand condemned. The Scriptures also say, for those who stand condemned, there awaits an eternal hell and eternal condemnation for our sins. And this is the right and just punishment for our sins. But, but there is hope. That hope is in the Savior, Jesus Christ, the one and only God, the eternal God, the God who has always existed and always will exist. And there are no other gods but Him. This God came to earth took on flesh, lived a perfect life, the life that we could never live, He died, bore the sins of those who believe in His body on the cross as a substitute, bearing the wrath of God in our place. And on the third day, He rose again, securing for us eternal life. And the requirement now is that all men, all women, all people, everywhere, trust in this. Believe. Entrust your life to this Savior. Because He is a good and gracious God. We cannot be saved by any other means. And eternity awaits for us. So if you have not tasted of this kindness, then taste of it this morning. And commit yourself to the nourishment of the truth of the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you totally dependent upon you. Realizing that we were totally dependent on you for salvation. Incapable of saving ourselves. But also seeing these things that you lay before us. These commands that you now give us 
that you've now freed us to live according to, and we recognize, Lord, our flesh constantly drives us away from this truth. And so even as we strive for holiness, as we progress in sanctification, we need you. We need you for all of this. We can do nothing in our own strength. So Lord, daily, Renew our minds according to your truth. Motivate us to live lives committed to your truth. It's your name that I pray. Amen.